So yeah, been a bit of a quiet week this week in terms of um, um, no Premier League football. So obviously our Monday show, we've we we're only covering the Prem till the end of the season. Um, so we we thought we'd do a little Q and A. I, I was wanting to do a little bit of a Desert Island Discs, um, and maybe we'll get to that at some point. But um, at this moment in time, we're worried about the copyright and getting shut down by you know YouTube or the censors or whatever. Um, so we decided we'd, we'd open it up to the to the fans, to the people who, who tune into our uh, show, and we'll have a a bit of a live Q and A. So Noah's gonna uh, probe and, and prompt me with the uh, with the questions, and then. You know, we'll we'll just add lib and, and talk around it. Obviously, there's there's a lot of stuff in the in the um, in the pipeline to talk about. Really, uh, surprised to see Nike, um, you know, release a load of kits and obviously alter the St George's Cross on the back of the England one and try to dress it up as open quotations uh, playfully. And I'm like, no, no, it's it's not playful. You don't, you know, change somebody's flag like it's. You know, you, you just don't do it. Um, and I can't believe more people are up in arms about it. To be honest, I've seen a lot of people who, who, who obviously were, uh, were really annoyed by it. And, and let's hope common sense prevails and, you know, Nike go back and um, obviously alter that because it's really disrespectful, I think, to, to our country to alter the colours of the uh, St. George's Cross. Was that was that your first question? Yeah. Oh, good. So I've kind of preempted you. Um you know, Nike kits are always top drawer. I, I had a look at all the releases yesterday, obviously, um, mainly because my boys will be badgering me for them. And and I am a, f you know, a football fan. I love I love seeing the new kits come out. And as I say, usually at the, the forefront of the good kit design of the big brands, you know, Nike, Adidas, etc. cetera. Um, so I was disappointed to see, you know, the, the England kit, certainly the back, back collar of it, uh, just have that, you know, tentacles of woke bullshit creeping into it and and again you know I, I wasn't the only one clearly there was a lot of people annoyed by that I think a guy started a, a change uh, change kind of petition today that I tweeted uh, had a, 11 people when I first tweeted it I think last time I checked and it was uh, just short a couple hundred short of uh, 5,000 so hopefully that gets a bit of traction and um, Nike just think about it you know they're a good brand um you know they, they, they usually um don't want to you know annoy certainly the people who, who who they want to be consumers so i just think maybe it's a bit of a maybe a bit of an oversight we'll put it down to on their behalf or you know maybe they are just getting a bit woke and, and as i say look i won't be buying that kit i'm gutted because i love the england kits and i always want my kids in them but you can't change the saint george's cross like sorry you, you just can't do that it's, it's not um it's not right. You know, I look at the French kit. Um, they made the cockerel bigger and made the emblem bigger. Never changed the colour tone or the, or the or the flag. Same with the Dutch kit. And and obviously the same with the US national jersey that they produced. I haven't looked at any of the other countries, so they're the only four I've seen yesterday. But I just felt it was really strange uh, move from them. And as I say, hopefully common sense prevails. And by the t time the kit gets to manufacture, um, um, that, that, that's that been altered because, you know, mightn't see much of them. But but trust me to to the English people, um, you know the, the the changing of the flag is is just not acceptable. Yeah, I'd see I'd seen this uh, doing the rounds online, and again I think the quote I used back to the the city fan who who made me aware of it was, you know people who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Um, you know I think City had announced record profits, eighty million pound or something this this uh, previous year, the last couple of years, and you know, to then turn the heat up in, in a time where, you know, the, the cost of living is, is really expensive for people on, on the renewal of season ticket prices and I just think is wrong. Um, and again, hopefully, you know, City go back and do something about it. And, you know, I playfully said, I've seen them for the last month or so on Twitter with the ad space pumping the Manchester ladies derby at us. Um, obviously, the ladies team will cost you a lot of money and, why not just get rid of the advertising for the Manchester Ladies Derby, which no one gives a solitary shit about, judged on how long you've pushed it and how many interactions it's had. And the crowd on Saturday at 12.30 will, um, will show you that. Nobody cares about women's football. Um, the second bit of that is just cancel the women's team. What are they standing here? Two, two, two and a half million, three million a year. Yeah, and just put that back into the fans. I'm pretty sure most of them fans couldn't give a monkey's ass about... Uh, 
you know, the ladies team. And if you took 100, 150 quid off uh, the increase of their season ticket and you said, look, unfortunately, uh, uh, that's going to come at the cost of Manchester City ladies, I'm pretty sure none of those Manchester City uh, fans would give a bollocks. Yeah, I've I, I seen a third one this week, I think, in, it was an Egyptian player, went down this week after somebody went down in, in uh, was it in Argentina? Um, you know, uh, since I spoke to Matt Letizia, really, since, since I spoke to Matt, and we obviously had Matt on the podcast, you know, your eyes become a lot more open to it, and, and there's a guy I follow online, Dr. David Cartland, I think his name is, who, who I've, met, I've tried to contact this week, but somehow we haven't managed to touch base. He He tweeted an article this morning about all the different headlines that are making different excuses for heart-related uh, problems. Um, some of the most craziest things you've ever seen, like, um, you know, exercise <laughs> or cause a, cause a heart attack. And it's almost like they're trying to normalise this kind of thing happening and, and obviously um, trying to normalise, you know, heart attacks in people who otherwise are perfectly healthy. Is it vaccine-related? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know uh, for certain. I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not, you know, vaccinal, whatever they are, vaccine specialist. Um, but certainly we have to ask the question, you know, this is something that has been um, in the public agenda for a long period of time. And, and the fact that people don't want to talk about it or they dress it up as being something else does make me think, is there something there? You know, really, really does. Um, I'm just seeing a ridiculous rate of young, fit, healthy footballers collapse on a pitch and have um, convulsions and you know, some some are dying, and and you know we we have to be open minded that that well could be vaccine related. You know, I'm not saying it is, um, but again, we have to open our minds and look into it and, and find out the the root causes of it. I mean, there was a young lad. I think he was playing the field game at one of the prestigious um, uh, universities, whether that was Eton or or some. I think it was Eton. Um, a young guy. A, a drop down on 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 the field there and died as well this week. So, you know, it is becoming far too normal for for my liking. And again, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but but also, you know, these things are happening right in front of our eyes. And to stick our heads in the sand and just you know just ignore them isn't isn't the way to deal with it. You know, it wouldn't be the way to deal with it. it was you? It wouldn't be the way to deal with it. it was your son or one of your loved ones. Um, and again, you know, if if there's nothing there, there's nothing to it, and it is just a bit of hysteria, then, you know, we have proper conversations, we'll find that out. But again, the amount of times people are trying to suppress this information or put people down or label pe people tinfoil hat or crazy, uh, does me make, make make me feel there's, there's, there's more to this story than meets the eye. And as I say, it's, it, it's really, really worrying to see young, healthy people collapsing, whether that's on a football pitch or in everyday life. And you know, we have to have some serious conversations about that because it does look like uh, th this mRNA vaccine, this this um, experimental, um, you know, rollout that, that that has gone right across the world has, has clearly had some consequences, whether that's, you know, long COVID or, or kind of, um, you know, effects of um, aftermath of, of, of getting these vaccines, as we've seen with the guy who challenged Rishi Sunak on on the program? Someone who was vaccine injured and life fundamentally changed uh, because of that. So you know, there's there's guys out there. John O'Looney, I think, is a um, a funeral director who's been very vocal about this in terms of what they're taking out of people's bodies. And again, you you just have to be open minded because clearly there's something going on because you can see people collapsing and the excess deaths are through the roof. <laughs> Both at the same time. Yeah, both at the same time, no problem. Um, yeah, is that is that his little weird mate that was on the thing? Like, they're so weird, aren't they? They're so weird. So strange. Like, who want to drive around recording other people? Like, what a strange, strange uh, daily commute that is. Uh, oh, uh, do I think men should be managing in women's football? No, I don't know. Um I get, I get it. It happened initially because obviously, clearly, you know, they, they, they wanted expertise in there to show the women how to do it. But I think the women are now at a competent level where they can do that. I think women's football clubs, it's going to be controversial, but I think they are predominantly kind of like hockey teams. They're like lesbian based. It's like a les lesbos uh, area, honestly. And 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 I was speaking last week. We had nine on our course. It was strange that. 
there's a team, a Premier League team, I'm told, where there's eight couples in the changing room. All right? So imagine you're a manager and you want to pick a team and you leave someone's partner out. Like, just think of the nuances with that. Also, the big thing was, I think it was only last week. Can you Google this for me? There was a, a Premier League woman's manager who's a male who was sacked because he's having a relationship with one of his players. Similar thing happened, I think, with the England women's manager, didn't he, at a previous club. So I wouldn't. I mean, if there's a load of women in a dressing room, you know, for me, um, you know, I don't believe men should be in women's changing spaces and I don't know the rules. I've not been in, in there, so I don't know how long they stay in there. I just think it confuses it. You know, keep keep women in women's football, keep men in men's football. It's quite simple. Just just stops any of the, of the stuff that can go wrong. Um, Premier League manager? Was it Leicester manager or something like that? Willie Kirk, shagging one of players. Or having a relationship with one of his players, allegedly. So he's lost his job off the back of it. And again, I said to you there, the couple's in, in and, and it is, and I know they're going to kick off at me for that, but that's true. The other thing was, speaking to some of these women players, it's a converting ground. So if you go in there and you want to play football and you're straight, there's huge pressure on you. The, the, the converting people to the island of Lesbos via uh, football. And I said to you, this wokeness, this DI, this gay communism that's coming down the track, the Patriots just ain't going to have it. It ain't going to wash with us. No matter how many times you call us misogynistic, sexist, racist, or any of your other bullshit labels, we ain't going to back away from this because it's a just cause. You can't tell us ups down and downs up. All right? Women's football is doing fantastic at the minute. But it, it's only doing as well as it is because of the success of the men's football. Now, if you keep infecting our game with your woke bullshit, then there's going to be a snapback. We're trying to have a reasonable conversation with you. You're deluding yourselves. I mean, I seen last week, and I think it's because she's realised her case is bullshit, okay? So Vine and Aluko Sue and me. Aluko realises her case is bullshit, and she's gone from being, oh, I'm so scared they had to leave the country because of what got said about her being Fred or Rose West, whichever one she wants to be, um, that she has now reappeared on Twitter after leaving Twitter, I think, or X four years ago. She then reappeared this weekend and just unloaded at me. I think she called me because of the goal for me, Mr. Go, Mr. Deep Pockets. Um, and I responded by saying, I wish my pockets were as deep as their forehead. And I genuinely do because it means I, I, I wouldn't be a, a, a far, by, uh, far behind Elon Musk. So... It was a strange one, but I think she's realised their case was bullshit and what they've said to her is go try and antagonise him again to see if he has a pop at you so that we can strengthen your case. But again, their case, their case is bullshit. It's a data claim. It's going to get kicked into touch. Similarly, when we get to court um, with Vine, it, it's, a, it's a slightly different case, but also um, we'll deal with him in, in, in all due time. And that leads me on to the, uh, to the GoFundMe Um to be calling me a grifter, which is funny because Eni called me a grifter. But actually, she's the ultimate grifter because she's the one who tried to sue me in the first place. I'm just defending, you know, the position I take, I took. I'm not trying to sue them for damages, albeit, you know, they started the, the, the ball rolling. And if I had a chance of doing them now, I would. You know, if you pick a fight, don't be surprised if someone turns around and gives you a black eye. Like, you, you can't start moaning then. So the GoFundMe happened because I got this counter, um, this counter offer from Jeremy from... Charity, he wanted a small amount for charity, a bigger amount for charity when Lawrence Fox lost, and then he wanted a large sum. But no charity involved anymore, interestingly, for Mr. Vine, no charity. So the ultimate grift. For 12 years, 13 years, he's been abusing me, harassing me online with his statements and falsities, defaming me. And after 12 years, you know, I responded because he said I had a brain injury. And, I'm, you know, we've done podcasts with John Stiles, I've read about the symptoms. I'm really worried that I, I may well have CTE, you know, that will affect me later on in life based on the research I've done. Um, I'm not saying I would have changed and I wouldn't have played football. I absolutely would have, but also that is a concern, and especially when you've got young kids. So when he was saying what he was saying on his national TV show, only because I never went on, because I refused his invitation to go on and uh, speak about women's commentary, um, him and Marina Perkis, um, Call the makeup trial with a trial on her face. 
Um, we've talked about my mind and, and injuries, brain injuries, and then followed up on Twitter and then came back on his show and followed up at the weekend uh, the next week by saying he went on, he shouldn't have gone online. So, you know, at that point, when you've got a 12-year-old son who comes in and asks you, um, Dad, have you got a brain injury? Are you going to live? Are you gonna, how long are you going to live for? Should I head the ball? Do, 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 am I okay playing football? Um, at that point, I think it's just to, to respond and, um, as I say, imbeciles, um, government mouthpieces, establishment mouthpieces, people who have sold the soul to the devil, um, shouldn't be on there thinking they can spout uh, nonsense about people, mistruths about people, and, and not have a, a reaction, a, a, um, a response to that. And as I say, I'll, I'll see Mr. Vine and his, and his lawyers in court, and, and, we, and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of that. I'm confident in, in the people I've got behind me. And as I say, the most pleasing thing for me was the amount of people who said, why don't you start a GoFundMe? Didn't know anything about GoFundMe. I've, I've seen them doing the rounds, but didn't know. So I went on, had a look at it. Ended up doing a bit of a chat GPT. I said, look, what would you say if you were writing a synopsis for Joey Bart on X, Y, and Z? And, and chat GPT wrote a bit of a long-winded piece. I then edited through that and, and then put it on there. As I say, for me, the, the fact that I think nearly a 1,000 people um, today have donated hard-earned money. The, the monetary figure is great because that means all day I'll get a few shillings because I've said I'm going to match that pound for pounds. That's fantastic. But the thing that touched me the most was the amount, you know, that the fact that there's a thousand people out there who were prepared to put their hard-earned money behind this type of course. You know, some of those people, when I said I was splitting it to Alderay, said they didn't, don't want to donate to Alderay, didn't want to donate to charity that they wanted to donate either to fight freedom of speech or to fight vine or fight to Luco, which is fair enough. So that's the reason I've said, look, whatever we get in there, I'll donate because that makes it dead easy then. You know, I'm able to donate to Alderay and obviously... You know, the, the, the money goes in the GoFundMe to, to defend this case. Just keeps it quite simple. Albeit, you know, all the naysayers and that have jumped on it, you grifter, blah, blah, blah. A grifter is somebody who... I'm going to have to get the definition of this. A grifter is somebody, a con artist, somebody who swindles people out of money through fraud. fraud. Well, that's definitely not me. And as I say, GoFundMe are working with it. The amount of times I've tweeted all the day into it. And anybody who's followed the GoFundMe from, from its conception has seen all the day has always been attached to it and being linked with it. So listen, all the people who've, who've, who've donated or shared or retweeted that link to, to drive awareness to it, thank you very, very much. Honestly, it, it touched me, the fact that you would, um, at, at this moment in time when life, cost of living is so, so hard, you know, stump up even a fiver or a tenner or whatever it is. Obviously, some people have been more generous than that because they're able to. But again, even if you only uh, retweeted it or just shared the link, thank you very, very much. As I say, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully deal with them in time. And the good that comes out of this bollocks of getting sued by dickheads is all the day we'll get some kind of uh, figure in there. As I say, whatever we get in the GoFundMe, I think it was at um, 12 and a half grand or something uh, this morning. Um, so that'll go to a just cause. All the days at a children's hospital in Liverpool, which does incredible things. And as I say, out of a bad situation, um, hopefully we can we can raise a few shilling for them. I, I, they came me for this last time. Should women's footballs have the same rules, dimensions, and that as for you have to be like I said this. If they wanted to improve the game, they should make it smaller. You know, make it ball size four. Bring the pitch in by about ten yards each end, each side maybe by five on the sides, 10 on the ends, make the goals a fraction smaller just because the keepers are smaller. And I think you'd get a more watchable product because it really at this moment in time just like looks like weak men in slow motion. You know, the, 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 the football isn't good to watch. It's not exciting. Um, you know, I don't mean to put the girls down, but you're never going to compete with elite level men's football because it's just so much quicker, you know, and that's the big, you know, men v boys argue, uh, men v boys, um, but also boys, under 16 boys, beating Olympic level women, you know, you don't have to look at the men, v men man versus girls thing or boys versus girls thing on Twitter to see just how athletically powerful 16 and 15 year old teenage boys are compared to fully developed females, you know, it's, it's, it's night and day. And then fast forward into fully developed males. Again, you know, you're taking another quantum leap in, in, in terms of speed and velocity. So, look, it's not for me to tell the women what to do with their game. I did suggest 
you know, shrinking it would, would make it a, a more watchable product. But again, you know, they, they want everything, don't they? They want everything at the same size. So if that's the case, no problem, it's their game. But also just be mindful of it's going to be slower and it's going to have completely um, different nuances to, to the men's game. And, and they may be happy with that. But again, I don't want to, not, want to watch it on my telly. I'd rather watch a League One game or a League Two game or actually a National League North game if I could. I don't think so. Like unless somebody want like it's hard enough doing a podcast. So unless somebody had a little bit of a brainchild and got behind it, then then maybe take part in it. But I I don't didn't really like that stuff. It, it was very very reactive. Um. So when I worked in the media for a year, I didn't really like it. You know, it it was as I say, um, you're reacting to things that have happened rather than making things happen. But I, I do feel there's a market for it. Certainly when I watch a uh, football program and. Um, now, you know, as I say, there's there's not much good on the TV for for a football fan, and they've managed to um, by going via going woke, you know, break down things that were funny, things that had good humour, things that were very informative, things that made you smile on the, on on the on the way to a game on a on a Saturday. Um, that was humorous for this sanitised, stale um, stat reading space filling nonsense that we're, that we're currently getting you know you have to think of this soccer social versus soccer am you know i know it went a bit shit in the end soccer am um but it was a lot better than this soccer social where you've got like people from like the traders or whatever on it um and again football focus has just turned into probably the biggest farce on the tv probably the wokest program obviously alex scott who's terrible at presenting on there and then you know obviously the the, the caliber of guests they get because everybody knows it's um you know it's 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 basically a leper of a show you don't want to be on it because it's terrible i've seen a girl on there this week the girl who you'll see and i think that the people like her she's something to do with yorkshire i don't know her name but she constantly has a face and makeup on and i'm not joking every single interview she does the tits are out tits are out of you and she's sticking the tits out um and I, uh, again, you know, I can't blame her. You've got to use every tool at your disposal. But she was sitting talking to Sander Baird from Burnley, who were about to be relegated, about, like, roast dinners. I'm like, is this, is this the best use of your time? Like, seriously? You might as well just show me your tits and, and like, like, that'd be better TV. Like, more, more men would watch that than listen to you trying to ask serious football questions because as you're asking them, most of them are looking at your tits anyway. The best team I played for, um, it's tough because I played with some great sides. But I did, there was lucky, came through at City. I had a great time at Newcastle. Like, love Newcastle fans, were incredible with me. Marseille were, were second to none in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the way the fans took me there. So it's tough to, to choose between, you know, the, in terms of, but in, in terms of the best year I had. You know, Burnley, I had a great year at Burnley as well, do you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, you, you, it's tough, tough to separate them, but my happy, the best year I had, the happiest year I had, total year, uh, was either win the championship with Newcastle, Marseille, I'd go Burnley, I'd have to say Burnley. That year I had at Burnley with, with the lads winning the, winning the championship was, was a phenomenal year. So as much as those clubs, I love playing for all those bigger clubs, um, I really enjoyed my time in uh, in Turf Moor. The maddest game I ever played in, uh, it'd have to be the 4-4, Newcastle 4, Arsenal 4. We were 4-0 down at half-time. Getting a football lesson. Van Persie, Cesc Fabregas, Abu Dhabi, etc. And I just remember going back in it at half-time. We were kind of shell-shocked. Pardew was our manager, and he just said, look, lads, there's 55,000 Geordies out there. Um... You know, you've got to go out and show some fight. You've got to go and make this a fight and you've got to keep the score respectable. Otherwise, um, when you live in Newcastle, it's tough to walk around the city because the, the club is in, in, in the heart of the city. Um, so we were playing for pride. You know, just get your bodies on them, see what you can what you can do. And we went out second half and I think I ended up flying into a tackle with Abu Dhabi. I won the ball but got a bit of him because Abu had had a load of bad injuries. He reacted. And he grabbed me by the throat, and obviously I, I, I normally don't mind the dust up, but you know sometimes you got to know with with Arsenal, especially Javinho and Abu Dhabi, when to lash yourself on the floor. You got to learn from the foreigners in that regard. Be a bit smarter. 
And um, Abu's grabbed hold of me around the throat. Um, obviously, I've obviously gone to the floor, and that was a red card for him. And they were still 4 nil up at that point. Um, and then we get back in the game, we get a goal, and St. James's lifts, and it's like, okay, they're down to 10, 4-1. Four, four, we're definitely going to make this respectable. Then we get a penalty, I managed to score a pen. Then we get another penalty, I managed to score that, albeit he almost read me, boy, Jack Chesney, he got his toe to it. I, I went uh, down the middle on the second one, but I, I, and I learned a lot from it because I, I ended up adjusting my penalty strategies after it, because I never expected to take two in one game. And he managed to hit his foot and go in, so got a little bit of luck there, but he'd already dived and it just he, he almost got it. Four three. And then obviously, you know, the best thing about it was, you know, Czech Tioti hadn't scored a goal for us. He was a phenomenal player, Czech, God rest his soul, he's passed away now. Um hadn't scored a goal. And it's a thunder bastard with his left foot on the volley from the edge of the box for four four, and the roof just went off the stadium. We almost scored late on to make it 5-4. And if the game would have gone on, I reckon another five minutes, we'd have beat them. They were gone. They were done. And, um, you know, we only drew the game 4-4. But in the circumstances, it felt like a, a lot more than that. And as I say, for the fact that Czechy scores that goal, I mean, he, he was capable of shooting, um, albeit he wasn't the greatest. It wasn't his greatest attribute with his right foot. But not one of us we would have told him to shoot with his left foot on the volley from there. And as I say, he caught his sweet as a nut. And it wh whistled past Chesney for 4-4. And I think that's the famous celebration where he runs down St. James's. St. James has gone mad to the other end of the pitch. And obviously Steve Harper kind of runs over and does a DDT on the pile on him. So that's probably the best game I've played in for all manner of different reasons. But but mainly, you know, the noise in St. James's Park um, when, when Czech's uh, volley went in. Best manager. Someone asked me this the other day in, in, in the pub. He was the best manager. And I said, you know what? I didn't appreciate him as much at the time, but Kevin Keegan was was really good. Natural enthusiasm, just made you love the game. Maybe not the best manager in terms of tactically and all that, but, but certainly competent and, and a lot more competent than people give him credit for. But again, his natural enthusiasm for the game was incredible. Um, in terms of who got the most out of me, I would have to say Daishi at Burnley, you know, for that year. He was he was brilliant with me, he just knew how to handle me, knew when to let me be myself, knew when I needed uh, some boundaries, knew when they needed a, a talking to, which was very, very seldom, but he, he just knew exactly um, what I needed um, in order to perform. And I would have to say I was, you know, blemish free with him. I, I don't think I got sent, I didn't get sent off that season. I was in team of the year that year. We won the league. Um, the only thing I would say is I never scored enough goals. But in terms of, you know, we will look back and say, if, if, I, if I had to pick one manager, um, uh, who would manage me for my whole career if I had my time again, I, I would probably pick Sean Dyche. I, I would have to say my best teammate, I was lucky, my best teammate was was Sean Wright Phillips. You know, played with him at City, where he was brilliant, um, and at QPR, where he, he was obviously not the same player. But as a lad in between, like we were roommates because he was a year older than me at City, he really inspired me to get through. I thought if Wrighty can make it, and we've seen him get out of our academy, he was the first one through the wall. And loads of us came out through after that, but he was really pioneering. And then obviously when I went up with the first team, it was the kind of two youngest room together. So although me and Sean are like fundamentally different, he loves playing computers at night before the game, I don't. You know, we we, we had a, a a good balance in terms of our relationship, in terms of, you know, we'd go and play the computer in the other lads' room who we were interested in it. And I'd obviously watch the footy and have a bit more of a quiet Friday night. Um, but we were we were as I say, really close from being really young. You know, we were both in City's Academy from 16, 17, went right the way through into the first team. Obviously, I left City, I think, at 24. Sean left a bit be a year or two before me in terms of going to Chelsea. And, we, um, you know, we, we, we were always um, in contact in the intervening years. And then, obviously, I signed back for QPR at 30. And right, he's coming uh, back to QPR, uh, signed for QPR. So we re reconnected again. And obviously, you know, you pick up your friendship from there. But we've... As I say, we don't have to speak every single day, but also, you know, for me in terms of teammates, he never changed over those years. He never changed when he was flying at Man City and he got the big move. He never changed. You know, when we were in England under 21 together, he, he never changed. When I met him when we were later on, he never changed. And even to this day, he's, you know, in the midst of, you know, going on his journey as a, as a player, he's always been the same lad that I met in the academy at 16 and 17. You know, we as I say, we don't always agree. 
um, on everything, but also, you know, I have an enormous respect for him. And, and as I say, f for me, as a teammate, probably across the course of my, my football career, he's as, as good of a lad as I've ever met. Uh, greatest player instead of uh, skill level. In terms of the best player I played with in the same team as, it, it would be Nicholas and Elke. I think Nicholas, nobody could do what Nicholas could do when he wanted to do it. That, that was the thing. You know, he was a, you know, not the most straightforward the character to everybody in the outside world, but I'm telling you from my experience, he was brilliant. He was first class with me, absolutely A1 with me and Sean because we were the two youngest in the team and he was the superstar. He didn't really mix with the senior players, so he kind of gravitated towards me and Wrighty. He kind of looked out for us a little bit as, you know, as kind of an older brother and was brilliant with us in, in different ways. Um, but in terms of raw talent and, and the way he played, he was a magnificent player. And then another Frenchman who I played with at Newcastle, only played with him for a short period, about a year, just shy of a year, was Hatem Benarfa. Um, Hatem, again, quirky Frenchman, but I, I got I had a great working relationship with him. And, and again, you, some of the stuff he did on, on the training pit, pitch was, you know, from the gods, you know, I, I truly believe, um, you know, in a, in a different uh, era, like this era now, he, he could have been right up there with... Cristiano Ronaldo's, you know, I don't, I think he's, he, he was that good. Um, you know, don't forget he went to Clairefontaine when Benzema and all that were there and, and Hatem was was rated as the best of the best. You know, the Clairefontaine Academy in France has produced Thierry Henry, you know, every household French name, you know, Clairefontaine has, has got fingerprints on them and, you know, he was the golden child. He was, he was meant to be. Uh, the be the very best that they produced, and, and when you work with them on a daily basis, you could see that. I mean, I remember playing for Newcastle at Goodison Park, and um, Hatem picked the ball up, and I and I was thinking he was going to pass it out wide, and with little to no backlift from about thirty five yards, he slammed one into the top corner, and I was just like, wow, glad the street end. Um, and it was I was right behind it as he as he pulled his leg and as he hit it, and it was as clean a strike I think you could ever ever hope for. So. Um, Nicholas, everybody will know and remember, but also Hatam was was a phenomenally talented player. Yeah. Toughest opponents I faced. I always said uh, the best player I ever played against directly, player to player, was Luka Modric. I was talking to Nico Krankyar and Nikita. Is it Nikita Jelovic? Nikola Jelovic? Yeah. yeah, I was in on my pro license last week in Switzerland, and obviously the Croatian delegation was there, and obviously my good mate Nico Krankyar, who I haven't seen for a couple of years, was there. So we were having a um, having a coffee and having a chat and, and Jelovic joined us and I was saying to him, look, I'm a mad Evertonian and we were, we were a great guy. And obviously, uh, 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 Vedran Choluka was there as well. So the three of us were sitting talking about the good old days of the Premier League and what was going on in um, in their country as opposed to ours. And they're suffering from the same uh, World Economic Forum um, immig immigration uh, overload as well in Croatia. Um, so the lads were filling me in on that, and and we were just chatting about best we've played against. Obviously, Joe Lucher, I think, is assistant manager for the national team. Um, and we were talking. I was talking to him about Modric and 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 you know what he stands for and how he trains. And he, he was talking about the Holy Trinity, which is Brozovic, uh, Kovacic, and obviously Modric. And he was saying, look, if them three are fifth for us, we've got a chance of beating everybody. Everybody, but obviously, you know, Lucher's coming towards the backstage of his career, but he was saying the way he trains, the way he prepares, the tone, you know, the, the, the tone he sets for training and everything is why he's as good as he is. And I was talking about when I played him uh, directly just before he went to Real Madrid when he was at Spurs. I just couldn't get near him. You know, every, every single move I made, he had, he had a move for it. He was just a world-level operator, which he's obviously gone on to prove at, at Real Madrid. But then I, I think back and I think the era I played in, you know, I remember... You know, I've played against Roy Keane multiple times, Patrick Vieira multiple times, Stephen Gerrard over 10 times, Lampard, Michael Michael Essien. Um, you know, I could be here all day, Michael Carrick. Um, you know, I, again, it's tough to pick one out, but, but I always say when asked who's the toughest opponent directly faced, um, I couldn't lay a glove on Modric. And, and most of those names I named before, I had... I had more than laid a glove on on most of them names who were who were some of the best that I've ever played in the league. Paul Scholes, another one, um, but but yeah, Luca was peerless uh, in in terms of absolute 
ridiculous level of ability. Paul Scholes, Gerard, Pat, uh, Stephen Gerrard or Frank Lampard, who is the best player? I don't even think this is close, you know. I don't even think this is close. Um, a lot of people think this is really, really close. It's not. Um, Stephen Gerrard was night and day, miles above Frank Lampard. Um, Paul Scholes was a phenomenal player. Um, I'm not knocking Frank because Frank's got an incredible goal scoring record. Like he's he's a fantastic player. There's no no doubt in that. But actually, he would he couldn't do what, what Gerrard could do. Like Gerrard could literally do everything. Like all different facets of the game. Frank couldn't. Frank could do lots of them really, really well, but couldn't do what, what Stephen could do. Um, and I think Skulls falls into that category as good as he was. Um, you know, I, I just don't think, you know, I haven't played against them all, stood into them all, you know, competed heavily against them all. You know, I'd play, I'd rather play against the other two um, before before Stephen Gerrard. Although I had I played I always played well against Liverpool and Gerrard, but he was a ph phenomenal athlete. People don't realize how big he is. People don't realize how tall he is, how quick he was, how big his legs were. He's a big man. Um, Scholes is not obviously not phenomenal player. Not Frank's, you know, big ass, big legs, back it in kind of Kev Nolan, big square, and and uses it uh, phenomenally well. But Stephen Gerrard was see the stars, Frankel. Freak, freak, like racehorse, like it's compared to the other two. And uh, as I said, I think individually, I, I don't think it's close in terms of honours won and goals scored and that. Obviously, you know, you know, people will, will argue the fact Man United, Chelsea fans or whatever, but St Stephen Gerrard for me was uh, a level above uh, the two lads. I've I've, I think I think he was two levels above Lampard and, and probably just a level above Skulls. I think Skulls is better than Lampard. Albeit, you know, they're all they're all world class. Like it's it's like small margins. I'm not saying any of them are bad players. They were all phenomenal players. As you can see, we've clearly uh, ruffled the establishment's feathers by, you know, shining a light on some of these issues. Um, if you want to support us and want to join our community, whether that's to defend freedom of speech, whether that's to affect social change for good, or whether that's to just listen to some good old-fashioned football conversation without any of this woe, DEI nonsense creeping into it. You know where to join us. We're over at Patreon forward slash Common Sense with Joey Barton. Come and be part of our community. Keep up the good fight.